Hello and welcome everybody to the episode 55 of the Full Funnel B2B Marketing Podcast. This is your host, Andrei Zinkevich, who is a founder of fullfunnel.io. And my guest is Nemanja Zivkovic, who is a founder of Funky Marketing and one of the top experts when it comes to demand generation. So basically, it's our topic for today's conversation. We are going to nail the demand generation programs. We want to share some practical case studies with you and uh, basically answer all the questions, all the potential questions you might have about the demand generation. So Nemanja, welcome. Hey, hey, thanks for uh, for inviting me uh, and thank you for uh, for the kind words. I really love that our um, you know, surnames are kind of starting with the, with the same letter. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, thanks. I mean, guys, uh, happy to happy to be here. Happy to to share some of the things that we are working on. Some of the things that me and Andre are going to discuss. And happy to answer all the questions uh, that I can. I suggest to immediately dive in, you know, and discuss the hot topic or a hot buzzword. Who knows? You know. Lots of people talking nowadays about demand generation. And from my point of view, demand generation really became a buzzword. So lots of people talking about it, but not so many actually can explain what it is. It's obvious that you know you want to create a demand for your product, but the question is how? <laughs> and my question to you, let's start with this. Is it a fancy new name for content marketing, PR, or anything else? How can you explain this? Yeah, definitely, definitely not. It's it is an essential part of uh, you know any company's uh, marketing strategy, and basically, I like to define it very simple uh, as the process that generates uh, interest from potential customer to buy your product or a service. So basically, just like that, uh, a broad uh, explanation, but. The way I see it, you know, um, around I was like 30 years ago. It's 90s or 30 years ago. Oh my God, it was so uh, so long ago. Demand generation was actually a hot topic for B2B marketers to adopt, and the idea actually started uh, as uh, you know, as we need to provide content and information about your company in order to generate interest and demand for your product or the service. And uh, you know, it's something that is important not only to get to get leads, uh, but also opportunities and identify the opportunity uh, for the company outside of leads. So not limited only to the leads. And as any marketing trend, it just took time before Dimension became uh, the mainstream. But you know, the way I see it, people are still focused on different on different models, still focusing on lead generation. Still mi mixing up, you know, lead generation and demand generation, um, and the way I see it, lead generation is basically focused on uh, just creating awareness, and compared to that, demand gen focuses more on um, generating qualified prospects. You know, uh, by providing valuable content, it can be via email, social media, like LinkedIn and Twitter. In, when it comes to the B two B. Articles on the blog, videos, or nowadays podcasts, uh, and basically we do that so that potential customers are actively engaged by knowledgeable people who can answer their questions and solve their problems. Uh, you know, things are actually simple if we explain them simple. But if we see the buzzwords, you know, demand generation, people uh, confuse it a little bit. You know, with uh, with inbound marketing, with lead generation, with advertising, you know, so uh, I'm glad that we are doing uh, this on the topic of demand generation and getting really into, into some of those things. And uh, let me ask you a quick question. So what's the key difference, let's say for people who don't understand, what is the key difference between demand generation and content marketing, let's say, or inbound marketing, if you will? Yeah, I mean, for me, the main difference between demand uh, and lead generation is that demand generation uh, is focused, uh, the way I see it, the company actually isn't focused on uh, capturing information from its potential uh, customers. 
So lead generation is focusing on getting the information, getting the email in this case, the name. Uh, but on the other hand, demand generation uh, is doing the company which is focused on driving people to take action with the goal, not necessarily to, you know, to collect email addresses, but rather to get uh, these prospects interested and educated. So when they are ready, they can come to us uh, with, uh, you know, with the willingness to buy, prepare to become our customers. So if I'm correct, um, I, I just want to sum up what you have said. So one of the key differences, let's say content marketing by default means attribution. So you want to have some content that will generate leads. So leads are on the top, or let's say leads are the key metric for the content marketing program success evaluation. And when it comes to demand generation, we just make it a part of marketing operations and the key goal basically where the words the, the word is coming from creating the demand companies your potential target audience your potential customers they are not aware that your company or your product exists so basically you don't have a demand and now you share the content and we didn't we don't uh, talk specifics here but basically the goal is to engage this target market target vertical or a list of specific target accounts with a dedicated content basically that first of all let's say touch the problems of these people educates them and showcases your expertise which naturally creates the demand. They tend to think, okay, probably this product or this vendor might be a good fit to solve this specific problem. And the key point here is the education. And what we track here, and probably the key metric if I want to evaluate, let's say the success of demand generation program would be the number of sales qualified opportunities, the length of your sales cycle, because you might have some let's say uh, some accounts in your pipeline and basically you want to accelerate the sales cycle. It might also impact the average contract value. It might impact, let's say the deal close rate as well. So am I correct with this, let's say sum up? Yeah, exactly. Uh, demand generation includes the full life cycle of sales. So it targets people in the awareness phase, in the consideration phase, and also in the, in the buying phase. Uh, basically encompasses all the touch points between between the business and the customer. And the, the, the one of the biggest differences between lead generation and demand generation is that lead generation is focusing just getting something out of out of the customers, information, email, contact, you know, those kind of things. And demand focuses on providing customers exactly what they want uh, to get at this point. Okay, cool. Uh, there is a question that is coming from Stefan, but how does this scale? It takes six months to a year to build something decent in terms of results. What do you do meanwhile? Yeah, it all, it all depends. It doesn't need to, uh, to take that much. We all know that in B2B, the, the sales cycles are longer. From three months, it can be up to three years. Uh, but you know, it isn't just organic. So, First, what we do, we capture the existing demand that's already there, but then we start creating the new demand. So we first create the demand that is already there. And this is what we do in the short term. So to, to do that, uh, we can also use advertising. Advertising is also the part of it. As we said, it's not only you know content and organic, it's also the advertising. So by using advertising, let's say in a way to uh, accelerate the content distribution, we can distribute content to the right people in a short amount of time and make them aware and educated about the, the problem they are having, about the solution that we, that we are having, and get them to come to us to actually convert and start using our products or services. But let me add my five cents here. Um, what I would like to say, it all, it all comes to what we want to measure, you know? First yeah. of all, let's be honest, if you'll apply, so we didn't discuss the channels right now, but let's, let me give you a practical example. So if you start LinkedIn demand generation, we have a specific dedicated 
sprint at full final, uh, which is six weeks long. And during the six weeks, we implement this demand generation, let's say, process. And the goal is to connect with the target accounts. It's aligned with more with account-based marketing approach. So it's not, let's say, mass market approach, but anyhow. So the key metric here is the acceptance rate by target accounts. Next one is the number of conversations with the buying committee members, the second metric. And you see, it's just the funnel. I'm just describing it step by step. So the next metric, which we want to talk is basically how many of these accounts will be added to our warm up program. We have specific programs to warm up these accounts. And the last one is how many of these accounts will be added to the activation program. And activation, the goal of the activation, so the last step here is to generate sales qualified opportunities. So, and LinkedIn on the top of the funnel, if we'll start sharing the content, if we are connecting, um, that's another story. I had multiple webinars on this topic, but again, if you are connecting with the right audience and we have four groups of audiences we need to connect on LinkedIn, then you create this awareness. And the key goal here is that uh, let's say with this demand generation process, you can aware target accounts while what Nemanja said as well, you can use specific advertisement to promote the right case studies or let's say if you have engaged accounts and you want to accelerate the sales cycle, you can target the buying committee of specific accounts with the case studies or whatever, depending on, depending on your sales process. And this is how you can measure the results. So the results could potentially come even in the, let's say, first two months. But here is the key question, maybe. When you can expect the, let's say, sales qualified opportunities. And the honest answer here, it really depends on your sales cycle length. Unfortunately, this is not a silver bullet, you know, that will shorten drastically the sales cycle. It will but not drastically and not immediately. So the number of sales qualified opportunities that might be potentially generated are correlated with your sales, with your typical or standard sales cycle plans. Yeah, I like, I like to say that it depends uh, if you have been doing something before you started this domain generation strategy, let's call it like this. Um, have you been doing something before, you know, have you been putting out content? Have you been working on your brand? Have you been doing something before? If you have been doing that, then it, it might take a shorter amount of time. But uh, you know what I say to people that come to us and you know they want results immediately, then I tell them we will just use PPC on LinkedIn ads in that way and you know target cold audience with specific things. You know? So it's, it's a different thing. To do so it's not you know creating the demand and coming up with there it's just targeting cold audience and getting people uh right away to buy something uh while we are creating the demand so it's something that goes in parallel with that cool so i suggest you know to discuss some practical aspects of demand generation and uh, the question i would like to ask you what are the requisites of successful demand generation program or what should you have in place before starting demand gen program? Yeah, that's that's the good question. And actually the question from which we should start. And I like to go with, uh, with you know, who we are uh, and what is our unique selling proposition. I like to start from us and to see what we have to offer um, that is, you know, different from the others. So the next question would be analyzing the competition. So what is how we are solving specific problems? Uh, and how is our solution different from the other? And is it is it different? You know, and uh, I don't consider like, it can be, you know, a lot of times that I hear, we have the lower pricing. And I, I don't consider that as an advantage, it can be for three days, maybe maybe a little bit longer, but it, it just takes, uh, you know, it can happen any moment that somebody comes in with a, with the lower pricing and there goes your unique unique selling proposition. So it, it needs to be something that is much more rooted deep 
inside your target group, deep inside, uh, you know, the, the problem that you are solving. And I like to go here uh, a little bit backwards and ask the company, you know, do they have like the strategic narrative? Do they have the old ways they are fighting? Do they have the new ways? What is the old way? What is the new way? And how is, you know, that change happening? And inside that change, we find the unique selling proposition. That's, that's my way of, of looking at it. I don't know if you have maybe, maybe a different approach, but this is how I like to simplify things and see, you know, uh, if we can get uh, to be really, really different in that way than the competitors. That absolutely makes sense. Um, I will try to add some requisites that I, I feel are necessary. That's something that you should have in place. And this is, this is let's say, related to your go-to-market strategy. Basically, what verticals do you want to target? What is your ideal customer profile? What is the buying committee of this, let's say, of, of your target accounts? And who you want to target with your content? Do you want to target and prospect all the buying committee members or the champions only or the decision makers? And uh, what else is really important is that your positioning, of course, and unique value proposition should be aligned with this vertical. But this, let's say, these are prerequisites. What else, uh, what else makes sense is to understand the customer journey. Basically, how they are going to, let's say, to become aware of your product. If they, if they have any challenge, I mean your target accounts, if they have any challenge, if they have any specific question, where they would go to find the answers to this specific question, with whom they will advise, where they will ask for the recommendations, these are the channels. Next steps, okay, so they, let's say they identified your articles or you targeted, you prospected them with ads and they identified your website. What are the next steps? What they're going to do, what they would like to consume. But it's, it all, it, it's all aligned with the, what, with the question, what are the questions they might have? Okay, they consumed this piece of content or this case study or this article. What should be the next step? What they would like to learn more? to move forward and what potential concerns they might have. So you need to overcome these concerns with your content. So these are specific aspects, I believe that should be added as prerequisites before starting uh, demand generation program. And uh, yeah, you, 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 took, you took the words out of my mouth. You know, those were the <laughs> things I wanted to mention, but uh, my question was related to the unique selling proposition and competition. Over there, but uh, let me let me add to what you say. I completely completely agree. Uh, and what I like to add uh, is that you know it's not only related when we analyze the the you know the the customers. Uh, it's not only that we should look what they are doing online. We should also look what they are doing offline when they are moving, what they are consuming. Uh, and here uh, I would like to say one thing that I think a lot of us are missing because we focus only on the, you know, on the problems, frustrations, those kind of things. We don't focus that much on the interest. You know, let, let's say we have three uh, ideal customers profiles and they all have one thing in, in common. It can be, you know, they, they all play basketball or they all, uh, they all have kids. I or know something where like this that. is coming from. <laughs> I mean, the basketball. <laughs> From a part yeah, of yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I think in 2017, I was, uh, you know, doing outreach, connecting with people on LinkedIn, but I was closing them on Twitter because they were talking about basketball, about fishing, about those kind of things. And I think a lot of us are missing that because we focus only on the on the business goals, on those kind of things, and we totally miss the human touch. Of, uh, of the ICPs. So who are they outside of the business? And I think it gives us a, a lot uh, of, uh, of things that we can use to create demand, actually to create, to create stories inside, inside all the content that we're gonna create for each stage for the potential customers. That's absolutely true. You know, I always say if anybody 
sent me a t-shirt of Juventus, you know, my favorite team, I will be always on the call. Even if I'm not the buyer, at least I will make several recommendations you know, and introduce these people to, uh, to the relevant accounts from my network. But this <laughs> actually has never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, what are the most common mistakes? Or let's say, what are the top three things that make demand generation program fail and down? Oh, that's an interesting, interesting question. I would say first one is uh, data, actually the useless data, because we are living in the times where we can collect so much data and it happens a lot that we have either duplicated data or incomplete data, or, you know, we have data for the similar audiences and we mix it up with, uh, with the one that we consider as the relevant one. And then we do, uh, we just miss the targets based on not having good data so or, or having useless data. So that is uh, one. The second one would be, uh, you know, getting no results from content marketing. It, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things can happen, you know, um, it can happen because of a lot of things happened before. So maybe not knowing who our real customers are, not going deep enough those are the mistakes like big companies are still making, not knowing exactly who their ideal customers are. Then leads are coming, but no one's converting. A lot of things can also be the reason for that. Some of those can be the way you are doing, uh, you are creating content. What is your content strategy? Who are you targeting with your content? Uh, or it can be, you know, the way you nurture uh, the leads that are coming. Um, or one that I consider, uh, I found it, um, I hear it very often in, in the recent months, is that uh, you can get customers to a call to get their feedback. I think it's becoming uh, a big of a problem these days. And we, I think we need a solution, you know, one of those ultimate solutions that will help companies uh, get across that problem. And uh, let me ask you a specific question. So you mentioned the useless data. I completely agree with you. Um, and we already spoke about the, let's say, spoke about the most important B2B metrics, like sales pipeline, like revenue, like average deal value, like sales cycle lengths. But how to measure? let's say the efficiency of demand generation program, basically what you are going to report to executives? You know, I would, I would go uh, a step back and uh, give information to people of some of the questions that we are asking before we start working with companies. Because usually when we start, they ask us, uh, can we skip this part? Can we go directly to create content or do the advertising? You know, can we skip this? Well, we can't. Why? Because this is how we discover, you know, when things are broken or do we have a process on what is happening. So we have uh, like we separate them in, in two batches. I'll call them like that. First one is related to all the forms. So what happens after a person fills out a form? Who owns that? For example, if, uh, if we get somebody to sign up for a demo, it's, uh, it's sales. If we have somebody sign up for a, for a webinar, it's marketing. Or uh, what's follow-up look like? What's the timeline? What are the next steps? Uh, what's the criteria for moving uh, you know, sales uh, acquired lead to sales qualified leads? And uh, you know, when they are logged in as an opportunity? What's the definition of a sales um, acquired lead? What is a sales qualified lead? What happens if a sales acquired lead is sent back to the system? You know, what, what kind of information is included? And we ask them to explain why. You know, a lot of companies don't, don't know the answers to these questions. So we go, go uh, back and explain a lot of that. Uh, another batch that we are asking them is related to reporting or some of uh, to the question that you ask. So, um, what is the sales and executive team looking at every week? You know, what are the metrics that they are going to? 
what data are they collecting in your reports and dashboards and why are collecting that data? Uh, what the pipeline and closed one looked like last month or quarter or the year, depending on how much did they do related to the marketing and advertising or sales in the previous period? Uh, what's the breakdown marketing source to sales source? Um, how many quote requests over the last 12 months and how many turned to opportunities? Uh, what marketing source were organic, direct, or paid? What are the exit criteria from one stage to the next? And how do they document the deals? You know, when you answer those 10-ish questions, you can, you can know a lot of things. For example, we had a situation with a client when we get into those things and we saw that the conversion from uh, free trials to the paid customers was only 3%. And they were so happy because they, they were getting too much traffic on the website from their content, organic, you know, but in reality, they didn't get the results. And they needed to answer these questions to go to the documents, to analyze the data, to see that it's not working. So usually uh, what, we, what we take out of this uh, are the things that you mentioned at the beginning. We look at the customer acquisition cost, uh, how much are they, are they getting lower? We look at the pipeline. Uh, so those are kind of the basic things and also the, the revenue, of course. So when it comes to SaaS, usually it's, uh, you know, monthly recurring revenue or for some of, of them, let's say in a, more in, a, in e commerce, it's lifetime value. So I like to look at those things and not to get, get too deep into, into those other things. Those other things, uh, like the, situa the situation that is right now, we get from uh, getting the answers to these questions. Um, the first follow-up question is, can you provide those 10 questions by any chance? Yeah, yeah, for okay. sure, for sure. Okay, so I will include it uh, to the email I'm sending with the let's say podcast recorder. And the second question is coming from Ilya. Uh, he asks, who analyzes this data? You or the company? And maybe let me add one more question. If let's say if we are talking about in-house team, who should be in charge of this analysis? Yeah, those those are good questions. Uh, look, I like to analyze them myself. But sometimes uh, it all depends on the size of the company. If they have the sales team, if they have the marketing team, I like to ask them when we start working, do they have those information? If they don't have it, then you know I get into the analytics and try to get everything that I can out of it. But uh, in most companies and early stage, so we're talking about you know seed A, possibly uh, they don't have it. They are just uh, at the moment when they are starting to analyze the data and to gather the data in the right way, creating the dashboards and everything else. So, uh, but you know, it all depends on them. Uh, you as somebody who is coming to the company and need to take care of all this, you need to be able to, you know, to get the information from them or from the tools they are using from CRM, whatever it is, and to come up with those conclusions. Uh, and to, to answer the questions uh, in-house, inside the team, well, it's also interesting and it goes and it varies a lot depending on the, on the size of the company, right? So uh, we are mostly now working with, with companies that are seed A to seed B. And in those companies, usually there is a person that connects all the departments in the, in the company. And it means that they are doing a good job. So there's a marketing person, there's a customer success, and there are sales. So, and there's a person that's connecting all the dots. So uh, that's one solution. That person that's connecting all the dots is the one that has the information that you need. So uh, that is the good, the good solution. The other one that's happening also is, uh, you know, the one that, that I like a lot, and it is that some that marketing department is the one that's, you know, that is running uh, all the things related to the revenue, and 
sales and customer success are inside that and on a weekly level they are aligning all of their efforts and you know changing exchanging experiences and going all the way alexey is asking um is this are these questions an onboarding step or it's like a pre-qualification process uh, it can be one or it can be the other. We usually use, uh, use those questions as, uh, not, uh, as an onboarding, but not a pre-qualification questions. Uh, what I ask in pre-qualifications is some questions to figure out how the, what's the uh, structure in the company, uh, what's, the, you know, what's the culture, what are all the things, all depending on what we are doing. Because if we, if we are changing the system inside the company, which is a bit more than demand gen strategy, then we need to have management uh, say yes to everything and leading the way. Because uh, if not, we will just try to do some work and it won't happen. Those things are hard, very hard to do. That's true. Uh, I suggest to review any successful demand generation program you have or had. So let's discuss the setup, the process, team, budget, and the results. Yeah, let's go. Uh, I mean, I wanted to go through two of them. We can even go three, but uh, the first one, uh, I don't know guys who are with us on the call, uh, Maybe you can tell us in the comments where you are in which stage uh, your company is service based on product based, you know, those kind of things. Cause uh, we can use the example of funky marketing or we can use the example of, uh, of uh, you know, SaaS business or we can use another one. So just trying to get, you know, what, uh, what yeah, we so you guys here. just type in the chat if you are, let's say, a product company or a service-based company. So we'll review the, the relevant example. Okay, three, okay, three. service, two. It's a mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, I, would, I would start with, with Funky and then go to, uh, to another one. Let's try to be fast and go through through both of them. Let's do it. So, okay, for, for the funky marketing, the facts uh, are, let's take a scope of the year. When we move from uh, starting the company from zero uh, monthly recurring revenue to right now where we are at 25K monthly recurring revenue as a service-based agency. So uh, when we started, uh, we, we did all those steps that we mentioned before. So we have the strategic narrative that we want to change the B2B industry and we wanted to change uh, the way people perceive the agencies because the situation was that agencies are doing just a little bit more than a basic posting on social media and doing basic advertising. And a lot of companies were unsatisfied with what they are doing how they are doing and after a month or two the quality of the services was going down so we wanted to change all that that's why the strategic narrative was bringing in the new way which is actually the old way so bringing marketing where it belongs and b2b industry was a little bit different than what it is now in a year it changed a lot so it was foggy mystic no feelings no emotions nothing so that was the thing we are dealing with when we started and to start, what we had uh, was, um, you know, just my personal brand on LinkedIn, which is, was mostly focused on uh, on just Serbia or Balkans, uh, and we had results uh, that came with working from the previous agency we worked we work with. So you know, it's the situation where most of the people will say we have nothing. So uh, in, in that way, we, uh, we created a strategy, a document of 32 or 34 pages. I don't remember right now. I can even share it after the call with guys. When we, it was actually a strategy, but with, the, with examples from the companies that we work with. So it was me and another guy that came with me. Basically the screenshots, the results, everything was uh, you know, the team effort 
and we were working in different agencies. Uh, and we created a simple landing page when we, you know, ask people, you know, if they want to scale their business, go ahead, download the ebook, and it was five emails follow up. Uh, basically, and the first day we closed the, the first client. Uh, well, it was it came through my personal brand because as Susan, as I publish it, we we came uh, through that, and then you know another one and another one. What was interesting, we didn't try to sell; we just offered thirty minutes consultation, and that's how we started. So uh, from one uh, landing page, and while we got the first customers. The first clients we were creating the website and all those and all those other things uh we were trying to be different within the name of the company the visuals the the way we were talking about us we didn't talk at all about a lead generation because it was all people were doing a year uh back nobody was talking about demand generation so uh, we went in another direction. So we used all those first things that you need to do when you create the landing page. We analyzed the competition. We analyzed the, uh, we proved the concept. We got the unique selling proposition. We got the landing page, then website and uh, lead magnet and the automation. So those are kind of the, the things that we have. And then only then when we prove the concept, when we prove everything, we went into creating the content. So we created the two pillars of the content strategy, uh, podcast, actually it was one, then it became another one, uh, and the written content. And while doing that, we come up with the distribution. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but I consider uh, distribution as the main, one of the main component of demand generation. Basically it's smart distribution of the content. And uh, while creating that, I just put it in an article. It's up to this day is one of the articles that uh, is the, that people are finding us through. Uh, and one of the articles uh, which uh, is basically used as a, as, a, as a bait for people to call me on the podcast and to talk about those things. Now we are even updating and expanding it. Uh, and we figure out that nobody is figure out the distribution. Companies don't have that figure out. So we added that in the offer and uh, coming up with all those things. Uh, we saw that other companies also had the, you know, the B2B game demand generation trying to do the same things as we are. So we were able at that only at that moment, it happened six months after we started to actually find out who our competitors are. And um, we found out that we can go on a much lower price than them because we are hiring people in Europe. They are in US, our target groups, uh, our ICP is in the US. So only then when we found out that we added the pricing page on the website. It reduced a lot uh, who is actually scheduling calls, who is coming up over there, what we have done, which is interesting and can be used and a good, is a good example. We had a first package, which is $5,000. Uh, and you actually don't get anything for that. You get only templates. And we used it just so people realize that what we are doing really is worth it. And you hire us to actually accelerate the growth of the company, not to be somebody who is implementing something that you know somebody from the company has imagined that we need to do. Uh, and just by doing those things, we were managed to, uh, you know, to choose now the channels. So we focused only on LinkedIn. All the team members posting every day, posting specific things, uh, hammering over pain points, but adding also personal things. And uh, just by doing that, we created the demand. Because we were present, we knew what we were uh, doing, we know with whom we're connecting with. And it turns out that uh, the either as ideal customers, we're not. Because we attracted startups who are, you know, uh, stage A startups, and we attracted service-based businesses, which have from uh, 150 to 800 employees. Uh, so 
basically uh, we are now changing again because we, we found out that, you know, new things uh, and it brings us to also important thing. Uh, I think Andre, we didn't mention that, which is optimization. When you know, That's right. it, it also goes through the content. It's also go to the ICP. It also go to the United unique selling proposition. Uh, you need to constantly optimize, get the feedback, see, you know, what people are reacting at, how they are consuming, how they're engaging, changing that and going, going after that. Uh, and one thing that's really different that we did when it comes to content and everything else, we uh, created, let's call it an event, uh, basically uh, something that we call funky marketing uh, awards. When we gathered 20 influencers from the industry, we did uh, an interview, we did a podcast with them, uh, and basically it accelerated the growth right before, uh, before the new year. And basically here we are now, we closed 39 deals in like uh, February, March, April, May, June. Yeah, like in 17 months. So, um, and continuing the growth, probably we will slow down, but you know, who knows? This is, this is where we are at the moment. So just to get back and to kind of elaborate what we have done. So we started with, uh, with one ICP, we started with the landing page, with the lead magnet and uh, automation of five emails follow up. We closed the first clients, we started creating content, we optimized based on the feedback. We started closing more clients, uh, we grew the team. It helped us grow a little bit more. We attracted more clients, then we adapted again because we realized that the, you know, the ICP is wrong. And now we are at the moment when we are doing it again, because we are again growing and again changing what we are doing and what our services are. Because as you said, demand generation changed so much during one year that we now need to do other things. There wasn't uh, a demand for aligning customer uh, success, marketing and sales inside the, the companies before. So now there is, and that's how it goes. So, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other example is uh, is really an interesting one because it's a, it's a startup, Seed A. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh -huh. about, okay, okay. Yeah, about your company. So first of all, um, let's share uh, let's share the team setup. So who is in charge of demand generation? Because you said like the team is doing this stuff, but uh, again, not everybody is. I I believe not everybody here knows the exact team roles that's the first thing and second thing i suggest to quickly nail the content distribution process so at least to give the idea because i think the most uh, common misconception is like that you need to post something on your linkedin profile or twitter profile and do the paid promotion which is obviously not true so let's let's discuss these two things Sounds good. Uh, I think I don't think we are the right example when it comes to you know aligning the main generation because uh, we are still five people. Uh, so in the company right now uh, is ah there is one thing that I need to mention. I name all the roles based on demand gen because they wanted to position us as somebody who's working in demand gen. So we have demand gen director, demand gen managers. Uh, it's all related to demand gen. So we have uh, right now is me who is the only marketing person in the company. Uh, we, have, uh, we have another person which is doing the distribution. So uh, when I say distribution, I mean the distribution of the long format of content. Uh, we have the, the guy who is head of, head of content, who is actually creating drafts coming up with the keywords, coming up with the strategy related to the content. We have the guy who is writing related to that. In all the process, I'm counting in uh, Conversion AI, which is basically a team member, and it helps us write 50 articles per month, uh, just with, with two people and uh, an AI tool. And then we have, uh, we have one other person, which is basically uh, you know, a guy who is helping out with a lot of different things and still going in to learn those things. 
outside of the company we have people which are connecting uh connecting all the other things so we have the girl which is doing visuals for us usually it's mostly canva i think it's it's just enough for whatever we are doing we have the guy if we have development things or the things with a website uh and also we have the guy who is doing if i cannot make it he's doing the the ppc facebook linkedin advertising and those kind of things those are all the people uh i mean those three or four that i mentioned outside the company those are all the people that i have been working for 10 years before i started funky marketing got it that's perfect and uh let me ask you a quick question so let's say if company wants to follow your process wants to follow your example what should be a pilot project so what should be the minimal setup let's say this is the let's say the role you need or the functionality and uh, what should be let's say a process for this pilot program yeah let let's go and see let's connect that to the to the content distribution yes i think that that can that can work uh that can work well so uh basically the way i see it uh companies usually have content on their website but it's the content that it's not distributed or shared it's actually very well written using the keywords and those kind of things so articles are the one main pillar of the content the second one is usually podcast or podcast today is the first one probably uh why because you are creating it with potential customers or influencers or somebody else from the industry so these are the two content pillars from the company which are uh one is created i recommend it is being created by the ceo or by the decision maker uh maker who is uh actually you know the authority in the company and you can get high level guests you can get potential customers just because ceo is the one who is leading the podcast so uh what happens when you have when you have the podcast or the the article uh how do we get into the distribution let's go with the articles first so uh a lot of people uh when it comes to the social media they they do again the same process create the the icps do the research and everything you have done that when you were writing articles so basically what you need to do is you need to break down the article into pieces come up the post out of it find the one sentence in each post that you, that can work separately as a visual without the text and use that as the post for linkedin and for twitter some of the longer ones you can break down into linkedin desk some of the shorter ones can go as separate post you can create different kind of content buzz you use personal profiles of the people from your team to distribute the content eventually some of the things with visuals those kind of things goes on the on the company pages but to be able to do that you need to hire the people that have the right mindset that personal brand is important that they uh want to show their expertise and work it's not something that works you know when you say them post and they post it can work for two days but not longer than that so that's one thing uh the other thing is uh podcasts we what we do with them when we create the podcasts we uh distribute them through the anchor so it goes on all the audio platform we post them on linkedin so it goes on linkedin we uh embed the links into the blog posts which goes on the website and that's how we distribute it as uh as basically an article so that's how we make also seo works uh and out of each podcast you can get at least 3 to 5 smaller pieces from 1 2 minutes to up to 10 minutes that's the limit on linkedin but right now everything is moving to 1 to 3 minutes uh those videos are working well so you know you do something that uh that you see all the time on linkedin so headline transcription you know something different we try now with the television so we are jumping out of the, of the tv and that's how you distribute it what's important here is that uh you distribute that content on the page and you focus on the guests so basically you build the personal brands of your guests and by doing that you are building your company page 
you also get all those posts with copy with uh, with parts uh, with smaller videos to the guests so they can distribute them as well. And while this is happening, you know, from your um, personal profiles, you add connect with people from that company, so the visibility can be can be even bigger. So uh, that's up to that. Uh, when it comes to uh, to then sharing the the full length content, uh, articles goes to Medium. Uh, part of the articles goes to LinkedIn as a separate post. Uh, they go to, to Zest uh, because it's marketing related content. Uh, they get, uh, we create answers out of them for Quora. We distribute them on Reddit in a, in a different way. Some, in some groups, uh, subreddits, it's, it's a link, just link somewhere. It's a, you know, a comment. Uh, we distribute them through the Facebook groups. So in a, in a different way. Uh, and um, we use sometimes it all depends for us we are rarely using it we were using it at one time but for the clients uh more and more we use advertising to accelerate the distribution of the of the the articles so we go to facebook and instagram and target uh, you know the icps and people who will actually use the tool or the services inside the company so decision makers and those that will use it we just want them to consume it then we follow up if they are actually consuming it on the website. And, uh, you know, if they are, we know that they're going to come back. If they don't, we can always use retargeting to get them back and to, you know, to get them to convert. So uh, in short, that's it. We can add a lot more things to that. So there are smaller communities like Revenue Genius uh, or some others which are related to more specific target groups, then we can also distribute articles. Now we are starting also to, to write articles for the Revenue Genius. So also that is a good way to, to get infiltrated into the, into the community. Um, and yeah, basically just find out what's working, what doesn't. We find out, let's say the last month that Facebook isn't working. A lot of people are coming to the website through Facebook, but nobody's converting. No, not many people are actually watching more than reading more than 30 seconds of an article. So we said, okay, that's, that's either uh, wrong Facebook groups or, it's the, is, or Facebook is the wrong channel. So we need to, to check that out and really go, go from there. So that's kind of the, the way distribution works. It's very simple, but it uh, demands a lot of manual work. And that's why a lot of companies didn't really get get into those things. Let me ask you several questions. I think that we won't have time to <laughs> review one more strategy. So let's nail this one. And uh, the first question is, so when it comes to, let's say, paid advertisement, it's clear. So you can set up the criteria for targeting and or you can upload a list of, let's say, emails if you want, or you can connect your CRM. That part is clear. Uh, when it comes to organic and let's say a company is starting out like Funky Marketing did at one point, uh, how to make sure that your target audience will see or will consume your content? Yeah, um, you need to be connected with those people. So that's that's actually one thing. But I will I will tell you another thing. Uh, mostly we're talking LinkedIn and Twitter. Right now, if you are talking about about B two B for LinkedIn, it's important with whom you're connecting with. So usually people say, uh, okay, those are uh, those are our. Uh, ideal customers and we go to the search and we find them, we add them and we sell them, you know, welcome messages, whatever it is. Uh, but that's actually a wrong approach because a lot of people on LinkedIn are inactive. So what we do, we, uh, we find outside of the industry or the niche when we are going, we find five to 10 people we could we call influencers who have like more than 20 people liking, commenting on the uh, 200 people liking and commenting on their posts. And we connect with them. We start commenting on their posts. We try to be the first one to give valuable comments, but also to connect with people who are liking and engaging on those posts. 
what does it mean? It means that we are going to connect with engaged people who are not starting from zero. They are not called, they are already engaged. And when they are engaging with those people who are creating kind of the similar content, they will engage with ours. Also uh, connecting with people who are just like us going after the same target group. Why are we doing that? I mean, you know, they are our peers, our competitors because we are sure that our content is good, is great. And they recognize us, they also react to our post because it, that is what they are talking about uh, as well. But if they recognize that we know what we are doing, they see the results, they see everything. So they will recommend us. And out of those 39 uh, clients that we, that we signed, uh, most of them came to referrals uh, through our peers or to existing customers. So uh, very little, small number of them came directly. Uh, so uh, also the third, the third group to which we need to connect so we can have you know, our uh, content seen is uh, newcomers. People who are you know, bringing up their visibility fast, we need to jump on that train and actually get over there. And the fourth thing, which is actually the hardest thing for the most companies, is we need to engage more on other people's posts. Without that, let's say on LinkedIn, we don't we won't get anything. On Twitter is a little bit different, but those are all the same people. So um, you do the same. You follow those people, you engage on their content. I think what's making the difference on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Uh, is how you approach those people when you connect with them. So we like to give them at least two weeks so they consume the content and then we send the welcome message. Just to you know, say hi, welcome to, to, you know, to my connection, to my community, however do you call it. And then you will get even the feedback of your content. If it's good, if it's not, do you know who they are, what they do? It's the same on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We, we build it first on LinkedIn now we're doing on Twitter and like every second and third person is responding as, you know, we are doing great stuff on LinkedIn. We are I'm following everything. I don't know who the person is. I never saw them, but they, they saw us and they saw the content. So that's what is important. So that's kind of the, let's say the shortcut. The audience is a little bit different and we won't even get into that. Your content needs to be uh, on a high level. And one more practical question, which I want to ask you, uh, who should be in charge? Let's say if we're talking about service based company or product doesn't matter who should be in charge of this engagement should be sales involved, should be both marketing and sales involved should be executives involved because that's as well. I think a question that lots of companies are wondering about. Yeah. Um, we like to do it. Uh, in a sort of creating a hub inside the company. So uh, it needs to start with the CEO or the founder because he is giving an example to all the other people. And then it's usually sales and marketing who are, who are active in it. If, uh, if they are hiring us, then it's us who are in charge of what they are doing, how they are doing, you know, aligning all of it. If it's the company doing it itself, um, it all depends. Uh, I like to think that it's CMO, the one who is who is leading the way and you know doing that. Because uh, in a lot of companies they have like a chief revenue officer, but it's usually a salesperson that doesn't look at all those things. I mean, the ideal one is somebody from customer success, you know, because they know customers and they can align marketing and sales uh, perfectly but it doesn't happen yet. So this is the way I see it. And marketing and sales both need to be there. Marketing is there to raise, to educate people, inform them, raise the awareness. So say when salespeople can approach, do outbound or whatever, their target persona will know who they are because marketing did, did their job and they will close the deals uh, easier in that way. I don't think, I'm not uh, the fan of the theory that, you know, marketing needs to prepare materials for the sales. They need to create the demand for the sales. That's actually a very good answer. Um, 
I love this session. I hope you guys too. Just let us know in the comments, was it valuable? Uh, how did you like it? And a quick announcement for you. So in the chat, I dropped a link to uh, our podcast so you can see the video on YouTube or if you prefer iTunes or Spotify, then you can uh, uh, just uh, subscribe to our podcast on these platforms and tomorrow this episode will appear there so you could re-listen to it. Um, one more quick announcement. So in September, we will be doing the second edition of our full final B2B marketing summit and Nemanja will be again talking and I hope this time we'll dive in in I think specific content distribution topics or oh, whatever so we'll see but stay tuned this uh, second event will be fantastic thanks a lot for coming up thanks a lot for great questions and see you in the next live episodes cheers thank you guys thank you Andre it was a pleasure